With that said, we're going to pivot now into our teaching time. And it, it's, it, it's kind of weird to get back into a regular sermon that's not outside and, um, and with a screen and, and a microphone. So that's kind of fun. But I do, I really did enjoy our last month of being outside. There's something, there's something special about reminding yourselves that the church does not need a building to be the church. And, um, but with that said, we're going to dive into, in fact, that's kind of what we're talking about today. The habit of mission is what we're talking about today. And, and none of these words, when it comes to mission, you're going to see a building, you're going to see a place, you're going to see a, a physical address, because the, our, our mission is not centered around a geographic location, a place that we go to. It's, it's part of what we do as a church and we gather as a church, but, that, but our mission is not dependent on that. And that was a good reminder this last month. So if you got your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at a passage today known as the Great Commission. And uh, it's, if you've been in church for a while, this is a familiar passage to you. If you've been in our church for a while, this should be a familiar passage to you. But if not, you're hearing this for the first time, this passage defines what we do as followers of Jesus and as a church. And so we're going to talk about the habit of mission and how that helps us to have health in our own soul. Last week, Pam was in Atlanta for work, so I was kind of doing the solo dad thing. And of course, it was the first kind of busier week back to life. Our, my older two kids were in band camp, so every day back and forth to Edgewood. Hannah was at home, and uh, if you know Hannah, we, she's a party animal. So when there's only, when there's only one of us, um, you got to play that game. And so we had, we had things we were going on. We had this trip, that trip. So it was a, it was a busy week for me, and we were all all of us were excited for her to come home on Thursday evening. But as you guys know, there was also a tropical storm that came up the coast during that window. And so um, we were worried that that would bring an impact on her, her return to our, her needed return to our family. And, um, and so, so she got on the plane Thursday night and they're like, hey, we're we're grounded for uh, at least an hour and a half. There's something going on in Baltimore. We can't, like, we can't fly there. We have to kind of sit and wait out this storm. And so eventually she did take off, but they had to like go way west and around the storm. And she was telling me it was a very, very bumpy ride. But we are glad that she's home. And that got me thinking about bumpy rides in airplanes got me thinking about this idea of soul care. And let me connect the dots here for a second. When you get on the plane, one of the first things they tell you in their safety briefing is that should the cabin become depressurized, oxygen masks will fall from above you, right? And what's, what's the number one rule about putting on an oxygen mask? Put on yours first before you put on those around you. And the reason for that is, is pretty self-evident. If you pass out from lack of oxygen, nobody is helped around you. Like you, do, you are no good to your family, to your spouse, to your incapacitated neighbor, whatever it might be. In the case of an emergency, if you don't get your oxygen mask on first and you go down, you are of no help to anybody else. And so that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I, think, that, um, I think that illustrates in many ways the importance of soul care. That that in a, in a troubled world, in a world where people look to you for support, in a crisis moment, if you don't have your connection to God there, if you don't have your intimacy with God there, if you're not abiding in Christ, like you're going to be no good to anyone else. You're going to tend to try to operate from your power. You might burn out trying to care for others. You might see fruit that isn't God's fruit. So, so first and foremost, when we care for others, our soul matters we need to connect to Jesus. However, though, in that plain illustration, if that oxygen mask pops down, your family's sitting around you, your kids trying to reach up there, you put that oxygen mask on, pop your headphones back in, grab your book and sit there, that's messed up. Like, like if the oxygen mask pops down and you just kind of like pull down the blindfold and go back to sleep, that's not the point. The point is not, oh, I got my oxygen, I'm good. No, the point is put your oxygen mask on and help those around you. And that's the same that is true with soul care. We care for our souls 
not just so that we are comforted, not just so that we are healthy, not just so that we can grow, but we actually invest in our health for the purpose of a mission that God has for us, for the purpose of serving others, helping others, investing in each other, for reaching into the lives around us. So soul care can't stop with just you focusing on you. It has to extend into the mission that we have for others. And, and God has created us. You and I, we're wired for purpose, for mission, and a healthy soul will always be active in that. Like you cannot have a healthy soul if it's just focused on you and not focused on others. There needs to be a mission behind a healthy soul. And so all throughout the summer, you know, except for our little, uh, our little outside break, um, from, from kind of the like beginning of May, middle of May, till uh, we got booted outside, we've been focusing each week on different habits of a healthy soul. And what I mean by that is things that you can do and I can practice every week, regularly, rhythms of our lives, attitudes in our lives that lead toward a healthy spirituality. We've kind of dipped into mental health. We've dipped into physical health. We've dipped into lots of, you know, community health. All these things lead toward the healthy soul. And there's a danger here to think that that almost just isolate ourselves and ignore others around us. To get so contemplative and so removed and so focused on our internal health that we forget that there's a mission around us. Because at the end of the day, soul health can't stop with you and with me. Salvation from Jesus is, 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 is key. God saves and rescues us. Not just to rescue us from our sins, but to put us on a mission and with purpose today. And so as we seek out soul health, we want to live that out. And we see that in the Great Commission. Let me read this to you because I think, I think you'll see how this all connects and how we are called to go and be on mission and, and what that means for our souls. I thought this was a great way to kind of get back in the building and remind us, even though we're not done with the series, remind us that as we focus on our souls, we go on the mission that God has for us. Here's our call. Let's look at this passage. Matthew chapter 28, verses, 20, verses 18 through 20, the, the end of the gospel of Matthew. He's, Jesus, or this passage says this. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. As a follower of Jesus, that's our marching order. That's our mission. That's our church's purpose is to go into all the nations, baptizing them, making disciples, teaching them to obey Jesus. That's what we're all about. That's the mission. And so let me, let me break down the the healthy soul, what the habit of mission looks like. But before I do that, let's pray one more time. Let's ask that God convicts us, changes us, and shows us, not through my words, but through his words and his truth. So God, um, as we think about this habit of mission, we look to you. Lord, we see this command of Jesus as so central, as so important, as so critical, and it's, it's our commission. It's what we do. It's what we're called to do. It's Jesus' last words to his people here on earth that, that we would go into all the nations and make other followers of Jesus Christ, God. And so as we think about our healthy souls, God, don't, don't isolate us. Don't let us be isolated, just contemplative, selfishly focused on our own lives without an eye for our neighbors and the nations around us, God, that you would drive us to share with others, to serve others, to help others, to be on the go for you so that as we are healthy, as we abide, and as we connect, God, that you would help us to serve others. God, convict us from your word where we need to change. Convict us of your word where we need to take action. And God, help us to live according to your purposes here today. God, help us all as we wrestle with what it looks like to have a healthy soul, to, to find that, to live in that, and to grow in that. So thank you for your work, and thank you for the, the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what does this habit of mission look like? What, what would a healthy person who's following Jesus, taking their faith seriously, what would it look like for them to be on mission? First thing I think is we see a commitment 
to going with purpose. Commit to going with purpose. There is an intentional movement in a follower of Jesus' life that looks around them and says, where does God want me to go? What does God want me to do? Who does God want me to engage with? And so there is a commitment to going through our lives and around our lives with intentionality. And let me show you here, verse, verse uh, 18. Let's kind of look back and just kind of walk through verse by verse. Jesus came near them and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This, this command, like I already mentioned before, this is the very, kind of the very last words of Jesus throughout the entire gospel. We're, we're in the 28th chapter of the gospel of Matthew. So for 28 chapters, we've walked through Jesus' life. We've seen his birth. We've seen him grow up. We've seen him um, call his disciples. We've seen him have three and a half years of public ministry. We've seen him do miracles. His disciples have seen him engage and teach. And so we've walked through the life of Jesus. We've seen him be rejected by his people. We've seen him be crucified. We saw him buried. And we saw him raised from the dead. And before he ascends into heaven, he gives his followers, his disciples, the disciples right there that he had, his 12 disciples or his 11 disciples at that point, but also us as his future disciples. He gives us this marching order. Go, therefore, into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey. That's our marching orders. That's the, that's the heart of what Jesus has for us. Jesus basically says, go and make other followers. He tells his disciples, go and make other disciples. As I've been your rabbi and you've been my apprentices, you go and be the rabbi and the apprentices. Teach them about me. Go take my way and teach them to others. And so the center of all this command, the center of this whole passage is actually the phrase, make disciples. When, when he says, go therefore and make disciples, the whole passage is anchored in the original language on those, that, that verb, making disciples. So going, baptizing, teaching, all of that falls under the command to make disciples. So, so making disciples is, is super central here. And we're going to talk about that in my next point. But we start making disciples by that very first word, go into all the nations. In order to make disciples and to be on a mission for Jesus, it requires an act of going. At some level, there is going in our faith. And so to make disciples of all nations, some are going to need to go here locally to neighborhoods, to neighbors, to their family members, and others are going to need to go there globally, around the world, to, to the some 3,000 some language groups that still have never heard of Jesus, to the corners and the, the, the pockets of the world where Jesus is not named yet. We need to have a going sort of faith here and around the world. We're not called to sit in our homes and wait for someone to come and knock on our door and say, hey, sir, I just was walking by. Would you tell me about Jesus? And by the way, that has happened before. That does happen. Like, that's awesome when God works like that in his sovereignty and the Holy Spirit convicts. Uh, I've heard of missionaries who literally have had people just like, they don't, even, they, they don't announce where they are, but they're in some country in the world. They're staying in a hotel. They didn't even know what hotel they were. And people will knock on their door and say, sir, someone told me that you could tell me about Jesus. Please. So like, that does happen. But our call is to go, not just to sit around twiddling our thumbs, but to go and share Jesus. And so your soul health, a healthy soul, a healthy spirituality, doesn't just sit around in contemplation. There's, that's healthy. I'm not saying it's not healthy to you know, reflect. We need those times. But there is a movement, an on-the-go for Jesus. And and here, here's what has me concerned sometimes is that we've boiled down the going of a disciple to things that aren't really what Jesus calls going here. Go to church. Go to small group. Go to whatever. Like, 
Not that those things are bad. Like you should, oh, we hope you go to church. We're glad you're here. We hope you go to small groups. We have some starting in September. You should be a part of one. Um, we have some new ones starting. But, so you should go those things, but that's not really what the going is talking about here. The going here is going to make other disciples, to go on mission, to, to influence others for Christ. Like we don't, going here, the win is to be on mission for Jesus. And so what this looks like for all of us, it's going to be different for every single person in this room. That's why I love about God's word is, is going here is so broad that it could be different for every single one of us. Tomorrow, your going is different than my going. Your spouse's going is different than your going. Um, your, your kid's going is different than your going. Like each family is going to have a different going. Like going tomorrow, it, it means waking up looking for the opportunities Jesus has for you that day. It means being open-handed with God, saying, God, how would you use me today? How should I serve you today? How am I going to be on mission for you today? It's, it's looking at the relationships and the places and the people that you're around with an intentionality that says, God, use me as your missionary wherever you put me, whether that's at work or at school or in my neighborhood or maybe even around the world, God. You are, you are my Lord and I serve you. So you're leveraging everything you have, your parenting, your, your relationships for Jesus. It's purposeful living on mission. And the truth is this, your soul will be best developed, best cared for, best challenged, but best matured when you're on the go for Jesus. When you, it, it is amazing. Like I can, I can read my Bible through the year, sit in my chair, have my coffee, and I learn some cool truths but you know when I really get to learn is when I open it with somebody else who doesn't know Jesus or when I'm engaged with somebody who is maybe struggling in their faith. That really helps to make this not just, you know, cozy chair time with Jesus, which is good, but it brings it to a whole nother level. And so going is a part of our call of a healthy soul. So how, how, what does going look like for you? Where, how, does, how does it change your life to wake up with that mentality? Let's, let's be on the moves. That's the first thing a healthy soul on mission does is we go with purpose. The second thing we do is this. And I, no, 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 uh, there's no doubt here, this is the central part of the passage, is that we focus on disciple making, making disciples. So um, no surprise here is what I meant to say is that not only do we go with purpose, but we commit to making, we focus on, on making disciples. We don't just go as followers of Jesus because, you know, we're, we're ADHD and we're energy bunnies and we just like to bounce around. Like that's, that's, not, that's not why we go. We go with a focus on, on Jesus and serving and, and making disciples. In fact, let me read this to you because I think you kind of see this passage tells us to make disciples, but it also helps us understand what that looks like. So verse 19 now. Go therefore, into, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. I think we actually see the, the how, the who, and the what of making disciples right here. Like the mission that God has given you, it's so that there's an outline right here for what you're called to do. How do we make disciples? By going. Who do we make disciples of? All nations, everybody. What do we do to make disciples? We see them baptized and we teach them to obey everything Jesus has done. It's just that simple. Go, everybody, baptize and teach. Now let's think about, let's just think about how, how focused and important those little ideas are. Because when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, that is a pivotal moment in the history of, of the world. Because Jesus' ministry, his whole life was focused on the Jewish people. Jesus spent his whole ministry largely focused on the Jewish nation, the Israelites. And so he, he preached the Jews, he shared the Jews, he did miracles among Jews, and occasionally he'd dip into the other areas. But his focus was on the Jews. But here, everything expands out. He says, now... Take what I have taught you and what I have done here in Israel and go therefore into all the nations, every single person, every single nation, every single background, every single country, every single ethnicity, all people of the world need this. 
I mean, he's always said that. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And so there's, now we see this command to go into all the nations. And that requires, that requires going, but that requires crossing boundaries. That requires boldness. That requires sacrifice. That requires mileage. That requires resources. That requires missionaries. And so, so our call here, all nations, is both your neighbor and the nations around you. So our call is, is to our neighborhoods and to the nations till every tribe, tongue, and nation knows Jesus. And so that's, that's who we're called to make disciples. So if you're wondering about that person at work, if you're wondering about that neighbor in your neighborhood, do they fall under the all nations category? Do they fall under the all people category? Yeah, they do. There's not a person that you'll encounter that is outside of this picture. Go therefore into all nations, whether they're here or over there. Everyone is called and can know Jesus Christ. And then in order to make disciples, Jesus gives us two things that we do. He goes baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I taught. Teaching and baptizing. Baptizing and teaching. And I love that mix because baptism, as we'll talk about, it's this this momentary commitment when you decide to follow Jesus and declare, proclaim your faith in him. So it's kind of like the, it's like the initiation, the entrance into the church. It's not, it's not your salvation moment. It's a proclamation moment of your faith in Jesus Christ. But then you have your, this teaching, which is this lifelong journey of discovering who Jesus is. And those two things paint a picture of our faith. Baptism being the beginning steps and teaching being the lifelong journey. When you think about baptism, what, what Jesus is saying is so powerful because we believe that baptism is, is what we often call the first step of obedience a person takes after making a personal decision to follow Jesus Christ. So we believe that baptism is a step that you take when you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, when you've made a personal decision to follow him. We see a pattern of somebody professing their faith in Jesus Christ and then declaring that publicly as a believer through baptism. And what that does is that, that shows externally, physically, what has happened internally. When a person is baptized, it, it shows them that they, it shows the world what has happened internally by, by the act of baptism. It's kind of a way of symbolizing and showing and declaring. It's a picture of what has happened inside you. Um, when somebody is baptized, they are identifying themselves, declaring themselves identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And if you've never been to a baptism, we do baptism by what's called immersion, which means you go fully in the water and fully out of the water because we believe that's, that's the picture in the Bible, but that's also the best picture spiritually. Like when Jesus died for you and, and had your sins forgiven, when you, when you are joined with Christ, you are fully buried with him and you fully raise into a newness of life with him. That's the picture of baptism. It's a, it's a commitment that says, this is what has happened in my life. And so, and so this is amazing because what he's saying here is go into all nations and help people profess their faith in Jesus Christ. He's speaking of people who are not just getting wet, but people who are making decisions to turn from their old life and turn to Jesus Christ, to, to transform from, a, from death to life spiritually, to, tra- to, to be a new person. And so that, that's why we see here this call to go be baptized. And that's why I think baptism by immersion, which what we do is, is a picture of that. I think Jesus models that. Um, when he was baptized, he went down into the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. Um, the word for baptism literally means to immerse. And um, I think about it this way. If you, um, if you wonder what immerse lives, you just come to my house when I'm having Chick-fil-A sauce and chicken nuggets. Like I don't just dab them. I, I dunk them good. Like, I don't want to see the chicken nugget um, out of my sauce. Like, that's, that's how I eat my nuggets. That's the word for baptism. It's you immerse it in that, in that Chick-fil-A sauce. So I say that because now every time you go to Chick-fil-A, you're going to think about baptism and God's going to be glorified. So congratulations. But that's, that's the picture here of baptism. It's, it's totally immersed. And so every believer in the New Testament was baptized that way. So 
Ultimately, we're told to go baptize because it's a picture of people turning to Christ, of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And that, that's powerful. And so let me just stop for an application there. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and have declared that through baptism, I would encourage you to do so. Um, this, is, this is what we often call the first step of obedience in a believer because Jesus says, go therefore and baptize. So when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ, the, the first step they take, the next step they take is a public declaration. I want to identify with Jesus. I want to identify with the church. I want to declare my faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what baptism is. Baptism for a believer is that first step in a lifelong journey with Jesus. And so if you've never made that decision, I would encourage you to, to make that decision. Jesus calls us to make that decision. In fact, um, Peter, in the, in the first sermon that he preaches after Jesus rose from the dead, he says this. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. When they heard this sermon, they were pierced to their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized each of you. In other words, come to Jesus for salvation and then take the step of baptism each of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. So there is a picture here that that, um, is you repent from your sins, you trust in Jesus Christ, and the next step is baptism. And so if that's a a decision you, you need to make, I'd love to talk to you about that. You can put it on your connecting card. I know we don't talk about it enough, but we want to help you with that decision. But here, Jesus is saying... Our goal is to go into the nations and lead people to this point where they turn from their sins and they declare their faith in Jesus Christ through baptism. And then the next step, the next step is teaching them to obey everything. I I don't have time to really dive into what that looks like, but the key when it says here in verse 19, going back to our chapter, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 says, teaching them to observe or obey everything I have commanded you. In other words, making disciples is not just passing on information. It's helping somebody functionally follow Jesus Christ in obedience. So it's not just Bible memory verses. It's not just knowing theology. It's not just sword drills, looking up verses. It is actually learning to follow Jesus and what he means for your life. Whether you are, you know, young in the faith, young in age, or old in the faith and old in age, we all have a target on what it means to take what Jesus says and flesh it out in our lives. And that's our goal there. In fact, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this so clearly. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. That's what God wants for your life. He doesn't want you to get sucked in by, by the news, by this, per, this party's agenda, that party's agenda, by, by this Facebook trend, that TikTok trend. Like, don't be conformed to this world. Instead, God has a transformational plan for you to be transformed by Jesus and his word and this book and then and live it out so that you can know what is good to God, what is pleasing to God, and what is his will. That's discipleship. Commit to following Jesus Christ through declaration and baptism, and then conform your life, transform your life through his work. And that's what we're called to do. And the process of learning about Jesus never stops and never runs out. We never stop learning about Jesus. One of my cool side jobs, I work a couple side jobs to help support our family and this church. And uh, one of the cool side jobs I've had the last year is helping doctoral students. I'm putting my doctorate degree to good use. And, um, and so I'm teaching these doctoral classes and I've been starting to do the, the very, at the very end of a doctoral journey, you have what's called an oral defense. And so for the last uh, three terms, I've taught, um, I've had about 36 different oral defenses where a, where a person presents their dissertation to me and, and others. And it's, you know, it's, it's often called a terminal, it's their final moment of their doctoral degree. I love it. It's, it's so life-giving. Um, But it's often called a terminal degree, which means there's no place left to go. Like, it's terminal. Like, literally, we joke around because it kills you. But, like, there's no place left to go. But here's why I bring that up. Whenever we're done with that dissertation, one of the questions I always ask, so if you ever take my classes, you'll know. What's next for your learning is one of the questions I ask. You know why? 
Because even though you have a terminal degree, learning never stops. And the same is true for following Christ. Just because you check this box, check this box, have done this, you never stop learning from Christ. Now here, here's what I want to wrap this up, or I'll wrap this point up. Baptism, making disciples, teaching them to make, teaching them to observe. There is a temptation here to make this look at us. I've been baptized. I'm learning about Jesus. I must be good. I must have checked the dots. That's not what this passage is about, right? This is not about you being baptized or you being a disciple and you being taught. Like that's, that's good stuff. Don't get me wrong. You should be doing that. But it's ultimately, this passage is not about you being baptized. It's about you helping others. You helping others be discipled. So in other words, disciple making here is not you and your personal journey. It's you coming alongside others to take those same steps. So disciple making for you, the healthy soul for you is not, I'm healthy, I'm good, I got my oxygen mask. The healthy step for you is helping others do the same. You're helping others be baptized. You're helping others teach and observe and obey Jesus Christ. That's the aim here. So again, the mission for you and me is not to be a disciple. That's not the mission. The mission is for us to make disciples. And that's hard. But that's our call. That's what we're made to do. That's what we're wired to do. One of the things I love about our small groups, and I, I hope you, I've, I mentioned this already, but you should join one. If you want to host one, talk to me or John. Like, we want to see more small groups in the fall. We actually like to triple our small, or double our small groups this fall. So we, if you're interested in being involved in a group, we want to get you there. But one of the ways we often study the Bible is we open up a chapter of the Bible and we read a chapter of the Bible each week and we ask four basic questions. What am I learning about God? What am I learning about me? Like as I read this passage, what truths do I see about God? What truths do I see about me? Thirdly, what do I need to do in light of this? And then a lot of us stop there, but there's a fourth question we always ask. Who do I need to pass this on to? Not, so it's not just what am I learning? What am I seeing? What do I need to do? But the fourth question we ask in our small group materials is always, who in your life needs to know this? Because at the end of the day, that's what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is a disciple-making person. And so that's our call. So there's a lot of things you can do here, but, but here, is, here is how I'll wrap this, sec, this point up, and then we'll, we'll finish real quick. You will never be healthier in your soul than when you are pouring out into other souls. That's the goal here for a healthy soul. Now let me finish, let me finish with this third point. Thirdly, we rely on the power of Jesus. Not only do we go with purpose and we focus on making disciples, but lastly, a healthy soul on mission relies on the power of Jesus. There is a danger that sermons like this can either guilt you into serving. So now you're like, all right, fine, I'll go tell people about Jesus or fine, I'll go disciple my kids or fine, I'll, and like, and you go and do things, but you do it in your strength, in your power, with your strategy, with your intelligence, like you go in your own strength. Or the other flip side is that you freak out. So one, one side, is one danger is you go, but you go under your power. The other side is that you freak out and go, I'm not doing that. That sounds too crazy. Like, what do you mean make disciples, teach people to obey? Like, you're asking, that's a big ask. That's a big task. I can't do that. And the truth is, we don't have the strength. We, we should be a little bit scared. That's why Jesus promises his power. That's why Jesus promises to be with us. That's why he says, you can do this. Now, now notice the whole passage. Verse 18 begins with this. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given in heaven, given to me in heaven and on earth. Starts out, I'm in charge. I have authority. I'm the man. I'm the boss. All authority has been given to me. You can go with boldness. You can go with confidence. I'm in charge of the universe. And then it continues Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Now notice this last phrase. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. How good is that? Jesus promises his authority and he promises his presence. 
When you live on the mission for Jesus, you have his presence and his authority right alongside of you. When you disciple your kids and teach them to obey, you have Jesus' authority to do that and his presence as you walk through that. When you share with your neighbor, when you go to the nations on mission trips, you have the authority of Jesus behind you and you have the presence of Jesus with you. So you can rely on his power, not, not your power burning out and burning out, not your fears that are keeping you back, but you have the power of Jesus to lean into. Now here's the crazy thing. I have never met a Christian who has said, I don't really want the power of Jesus in my life. Like, I've just never had that conversation. Maybe they're out there. Like, I've never met a follower of Jesus that doesn't want the power of Jesus, doesn't want the comfort of Jesus, doesn't want the hope of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the, the, the security of Jesus. Like, every Christian that I've ever met it says, I really want Jesus to work in power in my life. No one prays, Jesus, ignore me today. Like, everyone wants the power of Jesus. But I have met people that don't want the mission of Jesus. We want the power of Jesus, but we push aside the mission of Jesus. And, and here they're, they're linked. And it seems, it seems deeply selfish and self-serving to claim and want and pray for the power of Jesus in your life while rejecting the mission of Jesus for your life. That doesn't work. And I wonder sometimes if the reason why we don't experience Jesus fully, we don't see his power fully, is because we say yes to his benefits and his power, but we say no to his calling and his mission. And we wonder why Jesus isn't showing up sometimes. We reject the power of, we, we reject the mission of Jesus, but we still want the power of Jesus. You know, going, going back to my plane illustration, since let's be consistent, I love a good exit row. I love fighting people on Southwest for an exit row. That's my favorite. Like, I, I'm so sad to hear they're getting rid of that, that way of seating because I love it. I love sizing people up. And anyways, I love the exit row. I love, I love, I don't even care about the, the length, the a leg, leg space. I just like the fact that nobody's seats can recline on, my, on me. That's my favorite part about it. Like, I hate when somebody in front of me reclines. And I know they're allowed to do it, but it bugs me. And so I love the extra row because nobody can really climb their seats on my laptop and I got a little extra leg space. But if you are going to embrace the comfort of the exit row, guess what you always also have to do? You have to embrace the responsibility of the exit row. Because if you're sitting in an exit row, should there be an emergency on that plane, you need to help passengers open the door, help passengers out. And they won't even let you sit there until you verbally acknowledge that you will help. Like, will you be responsible? Yes. You can't even just shake your head. You can't nod. You can't be like, you have to say, yes, I will. You have to acknowledge. And so many of us, I feel like that's an illustration for our lives and the, the, the danger of our selfish leaning is that we, we want the comfort of Jesus, but we don't want the responsibility that Jesus gives us to make other disciples. And you will never have a healthy soul when you reject the mission of Jesus the responsibility of Jesus, but only pursue the comfort and the grace of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying God is gracious. He's kind. He's not going up there and going, well, you didn't tell 10 people about Jesus this week. You're, you're out of my power. That, that, I hope you don't hear that. It's a whole package. That we, we love Jesus. We want his power. And as we love Jesus, we go on mission for him. A healthy soul is a soul on the move. And so let's rely on the power of Jesus. And you will, you will experience the power of Jesus like you've never before when you begin to step out on mission for him, step out on faith on him, look to others and live for him. And so let me encourage you, take those steps. Your life will never be the same. So there, there are lots of ways we can respond to this sermon. I've given you lots of different things. How are we going? How are we making disciples? And how are we relying on Jesus? Are you living out this mission? I want our church to be living out this mission. Healthy souls live out this mission. Maybe today you need to make a first-time decision to follow Jesus. You've you never made a decision in your life to confess your sins to him, to believe in Jesus Christ as God's son, to believe in his death and, and know his forgiveness. If you need to make that decision, on your connecting card, it's an easy way to let us know. We'll help you understand that. Fill that out, drop that off in the back by the next next table. Um, if you need to be baptized, you know, I said the first step of obedience is baptism. If you've never been baptized, why the delay? Why the delay? Show people your faith. Maybe the call for you today is to, to get into discipleship. I need to be made as a disciple. 
or maybe it's to make others as a disciple. Whatever it might be, I don't know God's steps for you, but ask, let's ask God to convict us, show us, and help us to live on his mission. I'm way over time, um, but let me, let me throw this prayer prompt up on the screen. Here's a way that we can end. Just simply, we're going to take one minute and just in the quietness of this closing, ask God what the next step on his mission for your life is. God has wired you for a purpose. Let's pursue it together. Ask God what that next step is. So let's take a minute and pray, and then I'll close this as we close.